I am continuing to work through my chapter summaries for Matter and Interactions. Chapter, I'm on chapter five. So Matter and Interactions, just to be clear, this book, Matter and Interactions, Shabai and Sherwood, fourth edition, Wiley. Uh, so again, read the book. The book's great. I'm just trying to give you a summary for after you read the book so you can kind of connect your ideas. And I'm not going to go over every little detail, um, but let's just get started. So imagine that I have some uh, space uh, object, we call it a planet, and another space object, maybe it's a spacecraft, who knows, and that object's moving. Well, I know that there could be a gravitational force pulling on this object, and it's also moving, and I can describe the motion of this object using the force and momentum with the momentum principle right here. This is kind of a big deal. And this is what we've been doing so far. So this says that the vector net force, if there's just one force, that's fine, is equal to the derivative of the momentum with respect to time. Or if you have some constant force, I could write this as uh, the change in momentum over the change in time. And of course, the delta t equals zero, you get the derivative. But this, this says that if I know the forces, then I can find the change in momentum. And here are some of the forces that, that we've used so far. We've looked at the gravitational force on the surface of the Earth. This is a constant force, but I can calculate what that is, right? I just need to know the mass and the gravitational field. I can do that. I have a more complicated gravitational force uh, due to two interacting objects like this. So g is a constant, the product of the masses of the two objects, the vector from one to the other are uh, squared so it's magnitude then I use a vector to make it a unit vector to make it r to make it a vector force but i can calculate this force if i know where they are i can calculate the force done this is the force due to a spring if i know the amount the spring is stretched s and the spring constant and then the direction of the spring l hat i can get a vector force i can get the force and finally, here's one that we kind of talk about. Uh, what if there's an object moving through the air? There could be an air resistance force, where that's the density of the air, the size, the cross-sectional area, drag coefficient, velocity, v hat. I can calculate this. These are all calculated forces. So I even write that down here, cal q lay ted So if I can calculate the forces, I can find out about the change momentum. But that's not always the case. I can't calculate all the forces. So let's look at some another situation. Um, let's look at, I'm going to draw a picture of a block uh, supported by two strings. And I'll do it like this and like that. So there's my block supported by two strings. In this case, if I want to think about the forces on there, I have the downward gravitational force, mg, and then I have the string pulls this way, I'll call that t1, and then the string pulls that way, I'll call that t2. So if I look over here, I have the gravitational force. Where's the tension? How do I calculate the tension? How do I calculate that tension? And the answer is, you can't. They're not calculated forces. So I have things like tension, Normal force, we're going to talk about all these. And friction. I think those are the really the ones we're going to talk about. These are not these. These forces are not calculated forces. These, well, that friction's a mixture. These are, um, I'm going to call them constraint forces. There's no equation for them. You can find out what they are, but there's no equation for them. Instead, what we can do in this chapter, it says right up here, determining forces from motion. Before, we determined the forces and found out the motion. Now we want to find out about the motion and infer ideas about the force. So suppose I have this block right here, and it's hanging there at rest. Then delta P is equal to zero. We call this equilibrium, by the way. Equilibrium. You have to sound things out when you when you spell it on a video because otherwise your brain just goes out and you can't figure it out. 
If that's the case, and I go back up here, if delta p is zero, then f net is equal to zero. Zero vector, remember zero vector is the vector in Cartesian coordinates, zero, 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 like that. It's not just zero, it is a vector. It's just the zero vector. So in equilibrium, I know something about the motion and I therefore I know f net is zero. So in this case, I could write t1 vector plus t2 vector plus mg vector equals zero vector. So maybe I could find out something about these forces. I would need a little bit more information. And in fact, you could figure out those forces. Uh, but this is what this whole chapter is about. There are two cases where we know something about the motion. And the first is this thing that we call equilibrium. And equilibrium is delta P is zero. So it doesn't have to be P is zero, which usually is the case. It just means it has to have no change momentum. So if you have a car moving at a constant velocity in a constant direction, that's equilibrium. Inside there, it's equilibrium. Okay, so most of the times we'll, we'll be treating it like this. Okay, let's look at uh, an important thing that we're going to use, and that is a, uh, oops, a free body diagram. Free body, see I'm spelling it out again, diagram. Let's say that I have a block sitting on a table. And I want to create a free body diagram. A free body diagram is a way to represent all of the forces acting on that object. And so what we do is we start off usually with a dot to represent the object. So this is an important point in that we have point particles. So a point particle is an representing an object as though it only has one spot in space. It has no dimensions. We don't care about dimensions. It's just a point. It's wrong, right? This is obviously not a point, but it works pretty well in this case. We will get to later dealing with objects as rigid objects. And then it does have uh, dimensions and it does matter where the forces are. But in this case, all we care about what the forces are, not where they're applied. So I'm going to draw a free body diagram for this. Uh, and what I want to do is to represent every force acting on this as a vector arrow. So I'm going to put, I'm going to say the gravitational force, I'm going to call it FG. Uh, and then there is a force pushing up. I think the book likes to call this Fn for normal force. So when you write your forces, you're going to have two types of forces on your force diagram. Two force types. I was going to say types of forces, and then I missed the types. Uh, long range contact. So long range forces are forces that exert a force or interact with this object without touching it. Like gravity. Contact forces are things that are touching the object, like the normal force. And I and I like to break it down like this because really we're mostly just going to use long range force as gravity. That's the only really good example we're going to have. Um, but other than that, if it's not touching, it's not pushing. Okay, so there's no there's no Jedi that can push on things without uh, touching it. That's a Star Wars reference. Um, so don't, don't try to accidentally put those forces in there. So that's our first free body diagram. We represent the object as a dot, and then we draw all the forces acting on it. And let's go ahead and talk about this normal force, because the important thing here, why is there no equation for this? That's true. But if this is at rest, then I can say delta P equals zero, so F net equals zero. If F net is equal to zero, I can write these forces. So that becomes F n for the normal force plus F g, the gravitational force, is equal to zero. Now, this is plus because these are vectors. Yes, the gravitational force is in the downward direction, but that doesn't mean it's a negative. We're still summing up the forces. F net means add up the forces. But it turns out that if I call this the x-axis, and that the y-axis, it's easier to break this into an x and y forces. So I can write F net x equals, that's the x, equals zero, F net y 
equals zero. So if I look at these vectors in the x direction, what are their components in the x direction? Well, this has no component in the x direction. This has no component in the x direction. So I have zero equals zero, which although is very true, it's also very boring. And then the y direction. Now, what's the y component of this? It's going to be fn. It's pointing in the y direction. What's the y component of this? It's going to be negative fg. So that's where your negative comes in because it's in the negative y direction. And now I could write this as fn minus mg because that's my gravitational force is zero. And then I can solve for fn. Fn, the magnitude is equal to mg. Now be very careful, that's only true in this case. Because imagine that I push down with my finger uh, and then I, so I have an extra force pushing down, fp. Then in this case, it becomes uh, Fn minus Fp minus Mg equals zero. So Fn would be Mg plus Fp. So just be careful. This happens a lot, but I want you to be a caution about this saying, oh, normal force is equal to Mg. It's not true also if I have it at an angle, right? This, right? Because now the normal force is this way and the gravitational force is this way. And they don't, they're not equal. Okay, so that's free body diagrams. This is just a summary. I'll do some more problems involving that. I want to get to the other main idea, and that is one of the, the problems that we would deal with here is what do you do with the change in momentum when the change in momentum is zero? We call that equilibrium. There's another special case that we can deal with um, for uh, where we know the motion, and that's for an object moving in a circle. So let's say that there is a circular motion, uh, an object is moving with the momentum p at a constant magnitude. So it's going around at a constant speed, it's not changing magnitude, and it has a, a circle of radius r. Well, in this case, it turns out that uh, the magnitude, so this is constant magnitude p. So it's changing direction, but the magnitude's constant. Okay. So in this case, uh, I can write dp dt, the magnitude of that, and I have another video driving this. I'm not going to derive it. It's going to be uh, p times uh, v over r squared, r is capital R. Sorry. Blanked out for a second. Mv squared over r. That's right. No, m. No, this is r. <laughs> I'm gonna rewrite that. I don't normally write it this way. P v over r. But if p is mv, this is m v squared over r. That's just the magnitude of the change in momentum. So that is the magnitude of the net force. Magnitude. The direction is towards the center of the circle. So uh, I'm trying to, we, we write this as F, I'll write this as DP, the, the book does it in a weird way, DP perpendicular um, is going to be equal to negative M V squared over R, R hat. So in the opposite direction of the R from here to there, sort of pointing towards the center of the circle. And that's why we call this centripetal. force, which literally means center pointing, center pointing force. Okay, um, that's it. I think that's it. That's enough for now. Th there is some other stuff in there about like um, force perpendicular, force parallel, um, deriving this expression, which I do in another video. They talk about the dot product, but it's not super important. I think at this point, we'll get to the dot product later. Uh, really, I think the three big things are uh, forces of constraint, equilibrium, equil, librium, and circular motion. 
So if these are your two special cases of the change in momentum where we know something about the change in momentum, we can find out something about the unknown forces, and those three forces are, oh, I didn't talk about friction. Let me talk about friction really quick. So we can model a frictional force. Um, we can model the mag. So if I push on this this way, then I can have uh, the following forces, uh, mg, fn, that's a vector, FP, and if it doesn't move, there's a backwards pushing frictional force, FF. And the magnitude of that frictional force, the magnitude is less than or equal to some coefficient of static friction times the magnitude of the normal force. So there's two important things here. One, the magnitude, right, is less than or equal to this value. It can be whatever it needs to do to make it not slide. So this is not sliding. Less than or equal to. So you really can't find this. You can only, you can find the maximum friction force. Uh, mu is called the coefficient of static friction. S friction, I'll put SF. And it depends on the two types of materials interacting, rubber and asphalt, steel and wood. Uh, concrete and Teflon. It doesn't really matter. They all have a coefficient. And the harder these two th surfaces are pushed together, the greater the maximum frictional force. So this model is just a model, but it works fairly well. Um, so you can only find the frictional force at the maximum case, or you can say, well, it has to be equal to the pushing force to make the net force equal to zero. Now, if it's sliding, if the two surfaces are sliding, then we have this, F, F, K, magnitude is equal to mu k fn magnitude. So this is the coefficient of kinetic friction. It's, it's equal to this value if the two surfaces are sliding next to each other. So that makes us a mixture of a constraint and calculated force because you can calculate friction if you know that constraint. Well, you can't here. You can't over there. Okay, but like I said, we'll do some problems with friction and we'll do some problems with this stuff, but that's an introduction, a summary of chapter five.